very welcome. Good to see you again. And uh, what is it tonight? The last of six talks. And this one is on contemporary art. Mm. Conceptual art. The sort of art that has people really, uh, you know, puzzling uh, as to what it is and even asking, is it art? So um, I've, I've, I could have chosen a wide range of artists. I've chosen two artists for a particular reason. They're a little bit alike, and yet they're completely different. And they're both born in Ireland, and they both had a great connection with the United States, but they're also both heavily influenced by French thought and French intellectual philosophies and so on from, from the 19... 50s and even a good deal earlier. Brian O'Doherty was born in Ireland and trained as a medical student at UCD. He went to the United States on a Fulbright scholarship in 1957. He, he didn't abandon his medical studies, but he began to shift to becoming a, somebody who was really interested in art. And his work in, in Boston involved research into perceptual psychology, you know, how, how the senses apprehend uh, sight, vision, and sound, and so on. And so he sort of just moved sideways into the art world from the medical world. It was an interesting uh, transition, greatly helped by his uh, partner for many years, his wife, Barbara Novak, who is a former professor of art history at Columbia University. So they met in Boston in the late 50s, and they've been together ever since. Now, Brian was born in County Roscommon, small town, in 1928. So, and he's still, he's still going. I met him in New York last November. He told me he had died it was, it was evident that the, the evidence pointed to the contrary because I was <laughs> talking to him. But he had been in Berlin and he had technically died, but he said the German hospital system was excellent and they had brought him back to life again. <laughs> He's got a great sense of humor, Brian has, Brian O'Doherty. And um, Michael Craig Martin was also born in Ireland, and he was born in Dublin. His parents were actually working in London at the time, but they were very, very avid uh, Irish people with a strong national sentiment, if you like. So his mother was determined to return to Ireland so that he'd be born in Dublin. But the family then shortly afterwards moved to the Washington, D.C., because the father was working with the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization and so, and then with the World Bank. So actually, Michael Craig Martin had a relatively privileged upbringing and was, traveled the world a bit and then went to Yale University where he studied uh, not under Joseph Albers, which was something that a good number of artists did, but he studied under people who had studied under Joseph Albers. So the influence of Joseph Albers is critical to both these artists we're going to look at tonight. His influence comes again and again. And Joseph Albers, of course, was a famous artist who started his artistic career in the Bauhaus in the 1920s and then managed to escape to the United States and um, became a, a revered artist there. And... Uh, there's the, in Connecticut, there's still the Joseph Albers uh, Foundation, which, you know, preserves his work. And like the College des Irlandais, provides residencies for artists. So Nicholas Fox Weber, <coughs> is, who has done a lot of work on French art, is the director of that. But that's by the by. So we, we have these two artists uh, of the two. Um, Michael Craig Martin, born in 1941, so he's a good 13 years younger than Michael, uh, than Brian O'Doherty. But nonetheless, there are close points of comparison, as we'll see. I'm keeping it to one hour, if that's okay. I'll try. <laughs> I'll do my best. 
and uh, we can hopefully get this moving there. The Strange Case of Brian O'Doherty. <clears throat> this is an adaptation from the title of his novel written in the early 90s called The Strange Case of Mademoiselle P. But uh, Brian O'Doherty is, is an artist who has had several different identities over his artistic lifetime. And uh, among those, Sigmund Bode, Mary Josephson, William McGinn, and Patrick oh. Ireland. You will find writings and artworks by Brian O'Doherty under all of those monikers at various points in his career. He's an art historian and uh, an art critic as well as being an artist. And uh, his most famous book is probably called Inside the White Cube, which was published as a series of essays in Art Forum magazine in the 1970s and then as a book. And in it, he codified the development of the art gallery that we are so familiar with today. Indeed, there's a very fine art gallery in Centre Culturel Irlandais, just across the corridor with a wonderful exhibition. And that is that white cube. So instead of the Beaux-Arts tradition, instead of the old academies, instead of, 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 of the, uh, you, you know, the, 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 the richly uh, ornate galleries, which had been so familiar in, in the uh, Beaux-Arts period, you, you, you had the evolution of the white cube. And uh, Brian O'Doherty's book is, is uh, you know, sort of standard text describing the evolution and also the way in which the walls of those galleries began to operate as integral parts of the artwork in, in a way that was quite, uh, uh, you know, unusual. Um, he's also written books such as American Masters, The Voice and the Myth, which is a big coffee table scholarly book uh, about American artists of the 20th century. And, um, you know, he's, he's, he's got an extraordinary career because he was also like working in the 1970s with the, the late 60s, early 70s, with the National Endowment for the Arts, that great organization that uh, I believe is in imminent danger of having its budget completely cut. And in those days, the National Endowment for the Arts was a funding organization that gave money to artists, almost the only government funding organization in the United States, which is notoriously par par parsimonious in terms of the monies that it gives to artists, believing that they should be out in the market and making their own money. Although there are obviously many foundations where private individuals have stepped in to fill that gap. But the government gives its money through the National Endowment for the Arts certainly up to, up to recently and hopefully in the future. And Brian was a program manager for the NEA and in his time there, he introduced a new stream of funding which was completely unprecedented and it was for performance mixed media conceptual work. It wasn't for painting, it wasn't for sculpture, it wasn't for printmaking, you know, the old standard uh, things. It was a brand new funding stream. So it could be availed of by filmmakers who are also performance artists and dancers who are also installation, working with installation and artists who are working with sound and so on. And that was what people were doing in the late 60s. It was a conceptual art revolution. Saul Lewis, Eva Hess, Dorothea Rockburn, Mel Bochner, Robert Smithson, and Anne Graham. Those are just some of the artists. They're heavily influenced by Marcel Duchamp, who, as everybody knows, went from Paris to uh, Philadelphia to New York and had an enormous influence on, on the development of contemporary art. Hans Richter to Robert Rauschenberg and, and John Cage, the composer. These are people who very often worked with, um, sort of, uh, within, within a minimalist aesthetic, just uh, maybe s repeating things uh, or stacking things or working with cubes and grids. And uh, where did they get it all from? Here. <laughs> where else? So in 1955, this Citroen DS was launched at the Paris Motor Show, a marvelous marvelous car it's still greatly loved and uh, there are thousands of them still on the road it had advanced hydro pneumatic suspension and it was a sensation um, 1955 
Roland Barthes, the philosopher, was in his early 40s then. And Roland Barthes wrote about this car and many other things. And he described it as akin to a Gothic cathedral because it had been designed by anonymous people and built by people that nobody would ever hear of, like the cathedrals had. And yet it was kind of considered to be almost a work of art and, and revered as, as cathedrals were in the Middle Ages. So what Barth was actually very much involved with, and people in the audience will know far more about Barth than I do because he's integral to you know, Parisian intellectual thought of, 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 of those decades. What he was trying to do was to dismantle meaning, dismantle language to separate out the different components of meaning. So the conversation that I'm having now, it's flowing along and I'm talking like this and you know, you could read a book and it will be flowing along, there'll be a narrative, it'll be engaging, there are quotation marks, there'll be conversations, discussions. What Barth did and people who worked with him and in the same time, they dismantled novels. They took them apart the way you would take apart a car and they looked at all the component parts. And uh, they analyzed them in terms of uh, rather clinical scientific uh, criteria, if you like. So Barth studied Sarazine, a short story by Honoré de Balzac, which is uh, quite well known. Uh, Sarazine falls in love with the singer La Zam Zambinella, and she turns out, in fact, to be a castrato, much to his dismay. And there's murder involved. And the cardinal, who is Zambinella's protector, sends murderers, assassins to kill Sarazin. Anyway, it's a, it's a, it's, as you can guess, it's a fairly gothic tale, but curiously contemporary. And um, Barth extracted from it, broke it up into its component parts as if it were a motor car and analyzed it. He wrote a book on it, which was called S stroke Z or S stroke Z. <clears throat> and he works, you know, he devises his own system, if you like, his own map, his own coda, dividing it into five codes, hermeneutic, narrative, semantic, symbolic, and cultural. So what he's doing is he's trying to extract from that cultural object, individual, quite scientifically, rigorously determined um, aspects of meaning and what, you know, working out what, what were the signifiers and what was, what was you know, what, what lay beneath the surface, in other words. So you have the surface, which is that kind of engaging story. This is essentially what he was trying to do. And, uh, you know, uh, he succeeded. And he wasn't the first, and he certainly probably won't be the last. I think he's what's called post-structuralist. The specialists will, you know, have a, have a great deal to say, and, and book, many, many books have been written on Barth. But um, post-structuralism was, was a, a, sort of get a, a sort of literary analysis, mainly literature. So what you have here is you have literary criticism that begins to filter into the art world, and it begins to filter into the art world through a number of... Um, Avenues, not least the Centre Pompidou, which in 2002 devoted an exhibition to Barth. And uh, why was he so important? He said really that the identity of the author and the aspects of the author's life and the author's beliefs um, were almost irrelevant to the reading of the text. And the text that were produced had to be read in a very clinical way. And every time a text was read, it was read as if for the first time. So the work of art was created in the mind of the reader, observer, or onlooker at every point. Now we've come across this before in these talks because it was George Barclay in Ireland back in the early 18th century who worked out that the work of art is created in the mind of the observer and put that in, into his book, um, um, on, on Principi 
Uh, and uh, what Berkeley had worked out, which was quite important in terms of the history of philosophy, George Berkeley, he had worked out that sight isn't something that's um, innate. It's, you don't, you don't, uh, you have to learn to see from the earliest childhood onwards. So there are lots of experiments and conditions, you know, where people who have been blind are certainly given the power of sight and they actually cannot see. They have to learn how to see because the way you see is actually determined by so many cues that are learned from infancy onwards of distance, of depth, of color, of height, of length, of width, of texture, of so on color. So these, the sensory apprehension, the notion of sensory apprehension and, the, and reality being created within the mind is absolutely what George Berkeley was on about in the early 18th century. And it's interesting that, you know, it takes, it takes maybe two centuries then and his, his ideas are still valid and Barth is still, is still uh, you know, very much within that. Barth compared text to a tapestry woven from many threads by different, different hands. And in the, in, the, in, the new, in the New York art world, this had uh, quite a profound effect because up to this point, the dominant uh, mode of expression in terms of art in New York City was abstract expressionism, which everybody is familiar with. And that actually be he suddenly became quite old fashioned. Championed by Clement Greenberg, it's, it's, it had had its great heyday in the 40s and 50s, but by the mid 60s, people were beginning to question it. And the notion of the artist being the sort of solitary genius, the ego in the studio, very often a man and very often tortured, all of this began to s just began to look as if it was subscribing to a romantic mythologizing of what art was. And the structuralists and post-structuralists, influenced by Barth, who was enormous, uh, you know, he, he was really a, a very, very dominant figure at, at that time in terms of thought, they, they com went in completely different directions removing the personality of the artist as much as possible from the work, creating works that almost looked as if they'd been made by machines and works that uh, might be made by different people together. So this notion of the single creative genius was uh, something that was fading in 1967. Its, its fading was very hel strongly helped by Brian O'Doherty who was asked to edit a magazine, an art journal called Aspen. And he took the opportunity as editor, guest editor of this journal to put together a number of artists, some of them very well known, Morton Feldman and, uh, and Susan Sontag and others, but he put, he put together a box that contained uh, audio tapes and scores for music and uh, essays and, and uh, in, 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 and also there's even a small uh, sort of DIY sculpture by Tony Smith. And, and the people who subscribed to Aspen when they got the magazine and the post, and it turned out to be this box which they opened and all these things fell out, ha half of them were mystified and they threw it away. That was a great mistake because it's very valuable now. And uh, Roland Barth, it was asked by Brian O'Doherty to contribute an essay, and he did so. It's called The Death of the Author, and it's probably in this conversation the single most famous essay, and this was the first time it was published. Also in the magazine, you John Cage and, and Saul LeWis and, 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 and others. So it was really uh, an extraordinary time in the New York art world, and, and Brian O'Doherty was at the center of it. He was uh, able to negotiate his way within the art world in an extraordinary way. I think his medical training was of tr considerable assistance. He had a very good manner and still has. And he was able to tie together <coughs> groups that normally would never encounter one another. So the composers might be there and you know, the, 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 the uh, painters might be there and sculptors and he kind of knitted them together 
and would have uh, get-togethers and would make them engage one with the other. And he was a great friend of Morton Feldman, who was a, a composer of, of, of the time. From the get-go, Brian O'Doherty was interested in, I, I guess what you'd say, the best. So when he was a medical student, now he describes himself as self-trained, but I think he took some art classes with George Colley in a Little Laneway off Kildare, Kildare Street. Not many classes, but I think he was taking some classes in drawing while he was a medical student, and that, that was, you know, a, a tradition that went back into the 19th century and earlier. But he went to visit Jack Yates, who was in a nursing home in 1957, and he, he made a little portrait of him. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a touching connecting point, if you like, between Jack Yates, who we looked at um, in, in a previous talk, and uh, Brian, Brian O'Doherty. So we, 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 even at, when he was just still a medical student, he was kind of, if you like, putting himself into that straight line in, uh, that would continue through his life and has continued. His transition, as recorded in this work he made called Transformation, Discontinuity and Degradation of the Image, starts in 1969, and you see him going through the beat generation and then becoming, you know, gradually silver-haired, and then there's the sort of sunglasses, and these are the different personas, if you like, or the different identities. He's adamant that he has no single ego. He's adamant that his work is work that is created by a kind of collective energy. He's adamant that the uh, sense of his identity is not as important. He is a living representation, if you like, of the work of Roland Barthes. He's a living embodiment of, of the thinking that Roland Barthes had, um, had popularized in the, in the intellectual world, in the artistic world. And a lot of his work relates to reflection. So this is a, just a, a reprise of, of a, an earlier work where he pho photographs himself reflected in, in a shop window and he puts, he's mixing text and image, which is something that again became quite important, putting text and image together in the same work of art. And throughout his work, you'll find references to art history, to Magritte, to uh, you know, uh, these ce uh, pas un pit, the famous surrealist painting, you know, the, this notion that, that is running parallel to the work of Barth, where the object described is not the object described, or the notion that you can just easily say, this is a pipe, uh, can be uh, contested by the artist. So you know the Magritte painting you know, of a pipe, and underneath it, it said, this is not a pipe. So this is becoming quite a common thing in art in both uh, United States and Europe uh, at this time. And uh, it's really to do with categorization. So I think what you're looking at here is you're looking at a late 20th century, mid, mid 20th century flourishing of uh, a 19th century uh, motivation. And the motivation is, 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 is creating categories, it's cre creating typologies, it's, it's cataloging, it's all those, those uh, amazing books, you know, of natural history and so on with all of the species being, being cataloged with intense detail. And the notion then of the differences between species becoming uh, ever more uh, difficult to actually um, um, determine. So you get lots of slippages and uh, through his medical training, th th this is something which, which he becomes interested in, between categories. That's an early work. And um, it, uh, games are important too, games like chess and, and others, and he makes these games, and you can take out the uh, little cubes, and on the cubes you've got different sort of conditions and so on written on them, and you put them back in, so you can create different narratives from the same artwork. Seems like a funny thing to put in here. It's the Book of Ballymote. I think it dates from 1391. It's an Irish manuscript. It's in the Royal Irish Academy. And it, 
it has a number of things in it, like like uh, alphabets uh, and coding systems relating to those alphabets. And in particular, it gives a, a, an introduction to the Ogham, o Oham alphabet, or the Ogham alphabet. That's O-G-H-A-M. And it alludes to labyrinths, too. This book of Ballymote, funnily enough, is very important in the work of Brian O'Doherty. Although he's an emigre from Ireland in the most advanced technological city in the 1960s, you know, one of the most advanced in the world, um, those who live there might complain of the subway system and other things, but, you know, he's at the cusp of the 20th century and he's working in television, he's working in with sound, he's working with audio magnetic tape recording and, and broadcasting and writing and, and all of that. And yet he goes back to this uh, essentially early Renaissance manuscript uh, to, to create a, a number of key works. Labyrinths are very important in Brian O'Doherty's overall of probably because the game thing is important and also because in the labyrinth you get lost. And so they immediately form a simple paradigm, a simple uh, metaphor for the notion of the, the self and the self being an indeterminate thing, not a, not a fixed thing. As was the case with, with, the, with, the, with, with the Michael Craig Martin, with Brian O'Doherty, you find that he's able to realize some of his early work, you know, relatively recently. This is uh, 2006, and, and they managed to put together outside the Hugh Lane Gallery in Dublin a labyrinth design. But this is one of uh, several that, that Brian has done in their different museums uh, over the years. The, the labyrinth, as I say, is important. You know, you have, uh, it appears in Kafka, it appears in literature, it's, 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 it's a commonly used uh, metaphor. But Brian felt also is referred also to Ireland, where he said, you never got a straight answer. Every, every time you uh, asked a question, you got what he called bent answers. You know, nobody would. So he, he, was, he liked rectangular things. He, he didn't like curves. So there isn't a lot of that sort of Celtic swirling uh, motif in, in his art. He says you're always slipping off curves. That was the way he put it. He liked the Ogham alphabet, the Ohm alphabet. He liked George Barclay very much. This is called The Five Senses of the Bishop of Cloyne. Bishop of Cloyne was George Barclay. And um, in California, they say Berkeley, because at the university, there is named after this man. And uh, there is about three or four different universities in the United States that have close connections with the said same George, George Barclay. And the five senses, well, he's indicating them all there, and then he's putting them into a magic square, and this is something that appears in Dürer's Melancholia, and the, you know, the magic squares where all the numbers add up to the same thing, whether they're going vertically, horizontally, and so, you know, it's one of these sort of numerologically significant things in, in, in art history, and he's working with color too, so there's a little bit of Albers there, and it's, uh, he's trying to sort of work out a mathematics, a mathematical formula, scientific formula. And what he's actually doing in this, it's a game really, and the game is like, well, putting it very simply, some people are more auditory, some people are very visual, some people are very tactile, and some people, you know, uh, have a different combinations of, of these, some people can smell. Uh, acutely and taste, and others cannot. The strange case of Mademoiselle P involves a young woman who is blind. That's his novel. And uh, so you see within his writings, his novels, uh, uh, there's connections with, with, with these works too. And then there's the, the, coded, uh, the coded reference there with, with the Og Ogham alphabet. I won't go into it in great detail because it's quite easy to look it up, but you, essentially you see the center spine there and you see the way the, the bars refer to particular letters. So the vowels are very important in it and you've got these strokes that go through the central axis there on the left, one, two, three, and four, and five, and uh, O, U, E, I, so where does Ogham alphabet come from? It's Irish, it's from 
earlier than the Book of Ballymose. The Book of Ballymose records it, you know, uh, 500 years after it had been commonly used. But it was used from the say um, seventh century through to, to uh, uh, late medieval times, and um, it's the people who devised it knew what vowels were because the way the marks are made distinguishes between the different types of vowels. So linguists are, are very interested in the Ogham alphabet because it it. Um, you don't have sound recordings of how people spoke, but when you have coded systems like this that refer to the different way in which vowels are pronounced, then, then uh, you, you actually begin to get some quite interesting things. Remember Valency, our hero from the Royal Irish Academy in the late 18th century, and his mad escapades trying to prove that the round towers were influenced by Zoroastrian fire towers from India. Well, he was very keen on, 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 on Oum. You see the inscription there, Kilmel Cater. Most of the Oum stones, the Ogham stones, are in Cork or Kerry. There are some found also in Cornwall and Sc Scotland, I think. You know, there's a scattering of them, but the great uh, uh, concentration is, is in the southwest of Ireland. And uh, they've always fascinated uh, not only antiquaries, but, but artists too. And... Um, I want to mention while we're on this that uh, Charles Valency w was um, not alone in his researches. When he was, uh, you know, concocting these extraordinary uh, narratives, if you like, of the history of the Irish people, you know, that they had migrated from India, bringing these Zor Zoroastrian rituals to, to ancient Ireland with them, uh, he was... Uh, Nobody has ever given great credence to to his 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 books or his writings, and uh, but in Geneva in 1857, not long after Valency uh, had had his day, uh, a young scholar named Ferdinand de Saussure published Memoir sur le système primitif de voyelle dans la langue indo-européenne, a dissertation on the primitive vowel system in Indo-European languages, and. Um, where does Barth get his influence from? Saussure. Saussure is the origin of these philosophers who deconstructed language in the, in the 20th century. Among them Derrida, Foucault, and, 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 so, and so on. Now that's an, an Ohm stone in Kerry. And uh, you can barely see the, the marks on it. You, you, they could be highlighted with chalk or something. But um, they're memorial stones. They're very simple. The inscriptions are very simple, too. Uh, they can be in Latin or Irish. And it might be, you know, more or less, here is son Mac, Mac, M-A-C, M-A-Q, you know, uh, son of so-and-so. That, 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 that tends to be what, what they are. And what Brian O'Doherty did as a contemporary artist was he took this coding system the serial coding system and transformed it into sculptures such as this uh, from 1970, the Rake Progress, and a number of other works. Uh, it's very similar, some of them freestanding. This one is wall mounted, where the inscription on the uh, mirrored surface of this minimalist sculpture is based on the Ohm alphabet. And you see, he's playing with the reflection. And, you know, the viewer is reflected a little bit and the work also because it's angles, it reflects itself. And so there's all sorts of layers of uh, meaning uh, contained within this ex very, very simple work. He's, you can see he's keen on vowels <coughs> and he's keen on ohm. And his house, Barbara and Brian have a house in, in Todi in Italy, in northern Italy, and they've decorated. He has de not decorated. He has transformed the interior into, uh, uh, you know, uh, what would the Germans call it? Ungesamtkunstwerk, <laughs> a total artwork, where the house has become an artwork. And uh, he's adapted minimalist 
painting, wall painting, to uh, a, a sort of very traditional t Italian uh, interior. He's also done this work in... in no, they're absolutely on the wall, yeah. Uh, he does not use a traditional fresco technique. He will use acrylic paint, but, you know, that's... That, that's um, to coming closer to what I call home, this is what uh, a piece he did, a detail of a piece he did in the Sirius Art Centre in Cove in 1995, and it shows along the top. He's, he has written out for, as an introduction to the work uh, the Ohm alphabet, so that's a, that's a sort of key to to the code. The piece itself is uh, in a room this size, and it covers the four walls of the room this size, and so you see the four walls there laid out. And the piece is called One Here Now, and that's a very you know that's a, a motif, a refrain that reappears in in his in his work. Um. I mentioned Albers, and this is a comp absolutely a reference, the, 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 the watercolour, but with the text, he, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's entitled this work, The Sor Sorrows of, of, of Z, or Z, 1968. I wonder, I don't know, I haven't uh, asked him, but is he referencing Barth's work, you know, S S Z? Um, it's... Uh, it's an account of a person who's trapped in a box. And that box is within another box and another box, and there are five boxes. So that person in this, this, this text is rather a grim tale of somebody trapped in a series of concentric boxes or cubes, deprived of all sensory apprehension. So it's rather like, mm, uh, yeah, it's rather like Kafka, or, or, in, or I'm thinking also Samuel Beckett, you know, where his characters are uh, blind or, you know, unable to move or trapped in garbage bins or something, you know, so it's very Be Beckettian. And, you know, remember too that Jack Yates had that thing and was very much tuned into what Beckett was doing. So, you, you know, it, it's, it's interesting this. But with, with, with this, you're also, there's also refer, there's reference to uh, James Turrell. Uh, James Turrell, who is part of a movement called the California Light and Space Movement of, the, of, of this era, artists who worked with perceptual psychology. James Turrell would go into a, a room and block out all the light and admit only one ray of light, which would come and uh, you know, fall on the wall. James Turrell's installations have become world famous, and his Road and Crater in Arizona is, is a kind of legendary piece. Turrell would make the observer uh, submit to a form of uh, almost mental torture. Um, <laughs> I remember one piece he did in Poitiers uh, about 20 years ago, where you had to dive into a swimming pool swim underwater, and then emerge up into uh, a, a, a cube, which you floated in, and then above you, the sky was open. There was a white, you were in a white room, floating in water, and there was a square opening to the sky above. That was at an art centre called Confort Moderne in Poitiers. And the swimming costumes were like old bathing costumes from Victorian era, so everybody had to change, get into the bathing costume, dive in, swim underwater, and that's how you apprehend. It was not like walking into a conventional art gallery, I can <laughs> tell you that. The other thing that uh, Turrell used to do was um, he, he made Gansfeld spheres. The Gansfeld effect is something that you know, runs parallel with, with Albers in a way. Albers' book on color theory was very, very influential, putting one color beside another. But Gansfeld in, in Germany in the 1930s was working with sensory deprivation. And essentially, if you were put into a white room with no sensory uh, apprehension whatsoever, uh, after about a few hours, your mind takes over and you begin to hallucinate. So you begin to imagine 
uh, things that you see or things that you hear. So the, this is the brain reacting to what, what is, um, um, you know, the brain that's used to sensory stimulation in the absence of sensory stimulation in a Gansfeld environment when it's just this soft white light. Uh, if you stayed there too long, you'd have to be taken out like this, I'd say. A few weeks of that, you know, there wouldn't be much left of, 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 of sanity, I would say. So people have this extraordinary need to create reality around them. And this is what these artists are working with and working towards. And they're doing so um, uh, in a very, you know, co coherent way. Although some of the individual works, when you encounter them, you would say this is really... Um, if you want to make a Gansfeld sphere for yourself, you don't have to go to the expense of making a giant, uh, you know, domed thing into which you're slid almost as if it's a thing. You, you can actually get, a, a, you know, table tennis balls, cut it in half, put, put some string around it, and cover your eyes with two halves of the table tennis ball. That gives a good Gansfeld effect. Try it at home. There was a book written by Lawrence Weschler, published 82, Seeing is Forgetting the Name of the Thing One Sees. And um, that, that, that was uh, very, uh, you know, a very influential book of, of, of the period. And uh, it was a book on Robert Irwin, another member of, of this group I've been talking about. This is the, the, the novel I referred to. So as, as well as being... Artist, broadcaster, art critic, a novelist. His, it's the strange case of Mademoiselle P from 1992 recounts the tale of uh, Marie Therese Paradis. She was very well known at the time. Some people say that Mozart composed his uh, concerto for K456 uh, dedicated it to her. She was blind. She was in the Austrian court. She was very talented as a musician, beautiful pianist, great singer. She came under the care of Dr. Dr. Franz Anton Mesmer. Remember Yeats's uh, cartoon of the mesmerism? And uh, his idea about the blindness of, of uh, Marie Therese Paradis was that it was psychosomatic and had been induced by, 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 by childhood trauma. This is a fav favorite thing in Vienna and, and, and under Freud later too, the same. But this were in the 18th century, in the 1777. So she's a real person and uh, Brian O'Darty bases his historical novel on her imagining what the treatments were in terms of returning her uh, ability to see and he posits also a sort of dynamic within the court of, 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 uh, of, of in Vienna, this, uh, this Habsburg court, uh, where she was so, so, so highly thought of, so highly regarded. She trained under Salieri and, uh, you know, was a very gifted musician. And when her sight began to return, her musical abilities began to ebb. And her scheming father, who was so uh, devoted to her royal pension, said, if this continues, we're going to lose our pension. And so the treatment, Mesmer's treatment, was stopped. There's, there's, a, there's a, 19, a 1779 treatise uh, by Mesmer, which is partly used by O'Doherty to base his story uh, on. And... Um, uh, you know, el elements of, of, of it are, are um, uh, based on, on, on verifiable fact, but then he's, he's, em he's embellished it as, as this uh, extraordinary tale. Marie Therese performed in Paris, 1784, at the Concert Spirituel held in the Tuileries. He didn't have much, he doesn't have much time for Freud. He calls this work, this work is entitled The Therapeutics of Dr. Fraud. <laughs> um, so we won't uh, dwell upon that. Marcel Duchamp was very important in his work, in his life. And uh, now he, he, he is cautious about 
you know, uh, sort of, uh, I, I suppose, allowing art historians to say, well, look, you, you know, everything that you do, Brian O'Doherty, is sort of influenced by Marcel Duchamp. It is absolutely not the case, but he did meet Marcel Duchamp and uh, he wanted to do a portrait of Marcel Duchamp, so he got a, an electrocardiograph and he recorded Marcel Duchamp's heartbeat and uh, he exhibited the, uh, r the, the paper rolls as a portrait of Marcel Duchamp, which is very much within a Duchampian, uh, I guess, tradition. And he, 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 the, the work is uh, neatly, neatly boxed there, uh, as befits a, a fine work of art. He also then went a step further and got an oscilloscope and, uh, you know, had the actual heartbeat, you know, going as if the person, as if this was connected to Duchamp. And, uh, but it's actually done electronically. And uh, 1967, it, you know, and he was getting medical equipment, oscilloscopes, and, and working them into these little sculptures. And Duchamp actually came into the gallery when this was on exhibition and looked at him, his own heartbeat. Uh, and uh, O'Doherty was playing with this there's a humorous thing, but there's also a darkness. You know, there's a darkness at the heart of the humor, and there's a humor at the uh, heart, heart of the darkness. The critic's boots. Everything with Brian O'Doherty has references. He's, you know, there's an extraordinary level of visual sophistication. Well, as an art critic, he was tramping the streets of New York, so what better to do than make a, with the newsprint of his own reviews of exhibitions, cover his boots and make this sort of, you know, uh, Jasper Johns style painting. But obviously, of course, it refers to Va Vincent van Gogh's boots as well, which he bought in the flea market in Paris in 1888. Did he buy them to wear or did he buy them to paint? Nobody can quite agree. But, um, you know, there's a, there's a whole debate in art history regarding this painting, regarding the, you know, the whole message, the whole meaning of it. And so this is what Brian is, is, is referring to in, in, in his work. This is the, inside the book I mentioned, Inside the White Cube, and it translated happily, uh, yeah, and uh, available. Chess, I mentioned as being important in his work. This is the chess that he's designed. The chess pieces are carved or cut according to the way in which they move. So it's a work that, you know, uh, not a traditional chess set. And uh, chess is very important in a whole series of works that, that, that he's done over the years. Chess is also important in Beckett's work, in Endgame, that the title Endgame of Beckett's play r relates to the final moves in a game of chess. What the, what the, why chess is important is that the board has no central square. So, you know, everybody's moving. And for Beckett, any move was a mistake. <laughs> what Beckett wanted was like, make no move. I mean, his ambition was to have every piece on the chess board at, as it was at the beginning, at the end of the game. That was his idea of success. He wanted uh, Inertia, entropy. This this was Beckett's uh, idea, and of course, in in Endgame, you know, the when the, the main character is blind and uh, and crippled. You know, it's it's uh, it's um, you know, it's quite a grim. It's quite a grim play, uh, uh, along with Waiting for Godot. It, it's it's probably his best known work. Patrick McGee and Jack McGowan were uh, in the production in Paris uh, in the 1960s at the Studio de Champs Elysees of Endgame. And I, I love these connections because Jack McGowan, the actor, wrote an introduction to one of Jack Yates's books. So this was clearly, you know, there was a lot happening that, that, that hasn't really been documented in terms of connections. And O'Doherty was interested in chess as this record of mental activity. He takes away the squares, he takes away the black and white, and he just leaves the moves. This is the famous game between the American chess player, Paul Morphy, and a team of two, the Duke of Brunswick and Count Iswad. It ha took place in uh, Paris, this game, in, in, in the mid-19th century, in the old opera, 
the old opera, the one that burnt down before Garnier built the new one. And it took place in the interval of an opera called Norma by Bellini. And it's a very famous game in chess. So Morphy won. Well done. And uh, Brian takes the chess and he takes the board and he introduces you know, performers into this, uh, these structural plays, he calls them. You're, you're, th these are events, you know, so you're simply getting a kind of a snapshot uh, 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 there. These structural plays, they're, they're, you also call them vowel grids. And uh, they're very close to the way Beckett uses language. So, I am here now is one phrase. I am here now is another phrase. I am here now is another phrase. So it's all of this deconstructing language each way the, the inflection is used, it gives a, diff, a slightly different meaning. And uh, Wittgenstein, important as well in, in, in this history of thought. When, uh, it's, it's not a very good image, when uh, Brian O'Doherty tries to make a little por a portrait of Wittgenstein, he just takes 14 different pencils from the hardest to the softest and does exactly the same repeated image uh, with the soft pencil, so then it's fading away. They're very, very, very simple, very, very on, on uh, you know, but but quite eloquent I I in its own way. This is Brian on the left, Brian O'Doherty on the left. These are his different persona: uh, Mary Josephson in the foreground there, and Sigmund Bode, Patrick Ireland. In, in 1972, he took the name Patrick Ireland in a ceremony attended and assisted by Robert Balla, another artist in Dublin, to protest against the uh, massacre of unarmed civilians in Derry by, by, by British soldiers that had taken place. And he said, I will never exhibit my work in England until the political situation has been resolved. After the Good Friday Agreement uh, had succeeded and peace was restored and, and uh, uh, so on. There was a ceremony, another ceremony held at Emma in 2008, where he had a symbolic burying of Patrick Ireland. So, Brian, uh, when I met him, he, he admitted to having died, but indeed one of his persona has been literally buried. That's the funeral there. And um, Alana O'Kelly uh, uh, giving a narration, and, and Patrick Ireland then as a sort of ghost there. So the whole thing very reverential with the um, testimonial to the Duke of Wellington rising up in the background to remind them of Ireland's history. Drawings based on vowels, drawing based on, on, the, on this OM, OM alphabet. Beautiful drawings that uh, he, he works in a, in a way that's you know, quite mechanical but also the tremor of his hand and, and the, uh, the fact that they're handmade is very, is very, very important to them. Developing these into concepts for installations with this, you see, uh, using ropes and string in a, in a space. So this, this is part of this conceptual art movement where people went into the white cube they, and the white cube was no longer just a gallery where you put things on the wall. The white cube was a space that itself be, could become an artwork. So in this space, uh, a, a, a rope drawing by, by Brian O'Doherty could be created that would animate the space I, I, in an extraordinary way. And this is an early work from the uh, 1970s, which, which he remade in PS1 in, in, in New York, er, er, a piece from San Francisco from 75. And um, these, these are, you know, int they're quite cerebral works, and his art is very cerebral. They don't immediately engage, but as you traverse through these installations, the, 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 they're actually very carefully designed. So at certain points, the strings line up and you know, certain parts of the architecture are framed. He's, he's uh, referring to uh, Finnegan's Wake with this one. And uh, he's introduced again another cerebral element of James Joyce with uh, the initials, initials of Humphrey Earwicker contained within this, this, this idea of a, ment a mental map. And... Um, 
again, nice references to Beckett, you know, remember Pozzo uh, in, in Waiting for God, or there's a rope binding Pozzo and Lucky that shortens progressively as the play uh, advances. So he starts out with quite a long rope and then it gets progressively shorter, you know, symbolizing the way in which these characters uh, who are constantly fighting and, and giving out to one another are bound together. He's very influenced by Borromini, the architect of the Counter-Reformation in Rome. You know Borromini's churches in Rome. When you walk into them and you look up, there's a certain point if you stand in the center of the nave where all of the conf sort of confection of angels and, and uh, whatever painted on the ceiling in an illusionistic fashion comes together so that you get the illusion that the architectural space continues up into the painted space. And this is something that is part of Brian O'Doherty's work, where, where the architecture uh, is painted and the ropes are tautened in such a way and framed in such a way so that when you walk into a certain position, suddenly everything lines up. And it kind of, if something happens where a frame, a, an area of color, like, like the, uh, you know, the blue or the, the red, will suddenly be coincident with the lines of the string and suddenly the, the space will appear to change its shape as you're standing there. So although it's a very, you know, tw late 20th century conceptual artwork, it, it relates back to uh, Borromini and indeed there are specific, um, you know, he mentions Borromini on, s on several occasions. This is a piece in the Hugh Lane Gallery where there was a res retrospective of his work held. The one here now piece in the Series Art Centre in, in Cove, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a summation of his philosophy, if you like, and uh, it, w it, it was painted, it had to be covered over because it wasn't a, a permanent installation, it, it was kept for a year and then it was covered over but uh, I was involved with that project and when we covered it over, we didn't just obliterate it with paint, we covered it with lining paper. And uh, as we speak, it's being uh, un uncovered in, a, in an extraordinary archeological, uh, almost ex excavation. So from 1995 to 2018, there's now a project underway to uh, as if this was something from the time of Tutankhamun. <laughs> I'll tell you, guaranteed to make one feel old. But um, it's, coming t it's coming out very well. And uh, all the lining paper coming down and the rich colors underneath and the whole thing. So it's going to be unveiled, I believe, by Michael D. Higgins on April the 20th in Cove in County Cork. So if any of you are there, there's a whole weekend of events. And Alana Heiss from PS1, the founder of PS1 in New York, is coming over as well to speak uh, at, at, at that weekend. So um, that's, that's a, a, a rather, I think, fascinating culmination of uh, Brian O'Doherty's life. I hope he is able to travel t for the opening. I think he will. I think he's okay. You know, but he's very frail. 1928. Younger, this, this youthful, uh, relatively youthful, Michael Craig Martin, uh, his career echoes that of Brian O'Doherty in certain ways. He's best known for his wall drawings, but he's also produced sculptures, prints, and architectural designs. His aesthetic is extraordinarily close in its inspiration to that of Brian O'Doherty. He's absolutely in that area of divorcing the name of an object from the object itself, from for renaming objects, stripping away context, stripping away shadows, stripping away everything, working just with essentials, with a kind of a, a system that, you know, I think uh, almost gives r visual expression to the term semiotics or signs, you know, because this is, this is an artist who's taken the everyday and made it uh, into his own. And he studied, not with Joseph Albers, but at the school where Joseph Albers had just recently resigned from. So he was working with uh, tutors like Alex Katz, Jack Twokov, and Al Held, who had 
been, you know, uh, enthusiastic students of of um, of uh, Joseph Albers at Yale University, and his fellow students when he was studying included Bryce Mar Bryce Martin, Richard Serra, Chuck Close, uh, uh, Jennifer Bartlett, and Jonathan Barofsky. Those are artists who have gone on to create uh, great careers for themselves. There's almost a style that unites them. It's very depersonalized. It's very cool. It's very stylish. And uh, of them all, perhaps Br Michael Craig Martin has been the most influential. Although he grew up in Washington, he came back to Ireland every year with his parents. They kept the Irish connection very strong. He wasn't sent to any old school in Washington. It had to be a Catholic school, had to be a Benedictine school. So, you know, as he admits to himself, he never met a Protestant before he went to Yale. <laughs> and his parents were devout Catholics. <coughs> so I think it's quite interesting here because you have uh, one artist, Brian O'Doherty, who's almost, you know, working within a contemporary conceptual counter-reformation current. And then you have uh, uh, Michael Craig Martin, who, you know, just takes, takes off in this extraordinary artistic, career. Completing his MA in 1960, he traveled to Ireland and he made a film. These are stills from the film. It's a structuralist film. Each shot is exactly the same length, number of seconds. The camera never moves. It's very hypnotic. So it's a series of images and nothing's moving except, you know, the odd person, say, in the landscape, but the camera's not moving. And uh, so it's a structuralist piece, but it also obviously evokes the Irish landscape, that landscape that's so beloved of Paul Henry and, and those other landscape painters. And this is Michael Craig Martin, early, 1963, but moving, moving fast. He goes to England in 1966 to a teaching post at the Bath Academy. And very quickly, he's showing at the Rowan Gallery and Arnold Feeney and DeMarco, and he, he, you know, he, he's... He's working in this way that just infuriates traditionalists. They cannot figure out this artist who's arrived in, in England with these enigmatic and curious, playful works. Six foot balance with four pounds of paper. You see the drawing. The drawing of the object is given the same weight as the object itself. You know, these are pieces that involve physics, and, but they defy what you think you see. They're, they're playing with perception. A lot of his work is frustrate, about frustration in a structural way. This is a box where, the, where it's, you can't close it. You, know, you have to close one to open another, close another to open another. You can see it's a long box with, with lids. And the lids just, w w w well, the lid, the lid will work there, but uh, the, the, you, you find other, other long boxes where he's, uh, you know, he, they're, they're, they're just designed to frustrate. Look at this one. This is a box that never closes. The lids are designed to make it impossible to close. So this is frustrating expectation. This, this is a series of boxes where it, the lids have been, you know, the, lar the, the lid of the smallest has been put onto the biggest and vice versa. So each box has the wrong lid. And when they try to close, they won't close. So it's serial, it's structural, he's, he's, he's de deconstructing simple expectations. You simply expect a box to have a lid that will close, and so these are immensely, uh, um, uh, uh, they must have been infuriating, as I say, to traditionalists who saw them in the 60s in, in London. Of course, now it's in Tate Modern Collection and greatly revered. And there's a, you know, there's a sense of humor to the, the, the spirit level you see of the water in the different bottles there on the shelf, and a little humor on the, on, in the title too. So he's there's a bit of whimsy, but by golly, he's quite uh, you know rigorous in in his approach. There's that say as with Brian O'Doherty, whose works never deviated much left or right from a central thread, which is that thread that of Saussure, of Roland Barthes, of structuralism and post-structuralism, and of just you know apprehending reality and uh, creating sort of systems of meaning. So also Michael Craig Martin. Uh, has had that a kind of linear, unvarying uh, career that ha has, has brought him a considerable distance uh, uh, on the table. You, you see the paradox here. Four pulleys, four ropes, 
four buckets full of water. The buckets weigh down on the table because they're heavy. In doing so, they pull up the table to meet them. And so the whole thing is held. But there are no legs on the table. It's, it's you know, so it's, 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 a, it's a visual game in a way, but it's a serious game because he's underpinning meaning. This is a very famous work, and uh, it's, it's called An Oak Tree. And he just announced that the glass of water on the shelf was an oak tree. He put it in a gallery, showed it. He said, this is an oak tree. And when questioned, you know, he, he defended his uh, right to describe it as an oak tree. It's exactly like Magritte. This is not a pipe or, uh, and, and, and so on. So there's a long, quite precise dialogue there, questions and answers, where people are interrogating. How can you say it's an oak tree? And um, he, he never, I think he did have to deny it was an oak tree once. Only once, because it was being imported for an exhibition into Australia, and the Australian customs stopped it. They said, it's an oak tree, it's vegetation. <laughs> so uh, on that occasion, he had to fess up, if you like, and say, it's a glass of water on the shelf. But it's not the point. The point of the work is about the assigning of meaning to objects, the naming of objects, and the way in which reality is created by, you know, in, in this everyday way that... George Barclay had identified in the early 18th century. The connections between uh, uh, Brian O'Doherty and, and, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and Michael Craig Martin have, have never, I think, been explored. And yet they seem to be like two, two uh, characters in a Beckett play almost, you know, mirroring and echoing uh, each other's work on different sides of the Atlantic. Craig Martin in, in the UK, where he settled, became a tutor at Goldsmiths, taught Damien Hirst, taught Sarah Lucas, Gary Hoon. All of those names in what's called the YBA, the Young British Artist thing, nearly all of the big names in that were students of Craig Martin. He got a knighthood uh, for his services to the British art world. And, you know, in terms of that honor system, as such as it is, uh, he deserved it because uh, his influence in the world of contemporary art has been phenomenal. And, uh, it, and, and yet is quite, you know, there's, Brian O'Doherty's has been equally influential with the White Cube and with so many things, but it's interesting that I don't think any exhibition has ever really put them together and looked at the work year by year and analyzed. Yes, they work with books. They both work very often with books. This is a drawing from an open book, 1974. And um, they love the paradox. This is a short film for Zeno. Zeno is a, um, you know, the Greek philosopher who sort of said, well, look, the arrows got to be in a place at any given instant, and it's there. And in that instant, so if you think about it logically, the arrow cannot move. Uh, yeah, of course the arrow goes, but Aristotle repeats this. It's it's a famous sort of, uh, what, what would the word be? You know, it's counterintuitive, but through logic, they, 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 um, they demonstrate that it's conceptually impossible for the arrow to move because it's got to be at the same point in, in each instant. Um, untitled painting could be a white minimalist canvas, but he's put a little piece of constable into it. And, uh, you know, he's playing with art history. The thing about Craig Martin is that it's all up for grabs. You know, art is very irreverent, but it's very seriously irreverent. You know, it's, it's not uh, playful. Uh, in a certain way. It's monumental very often. These are large drawings. These, this is really what he kind of made his name with in terms of exhibitions at the Rowan Gallery in the late 70s, early 80s. They're done with black tape on directly on the wall, the same way that we saw with, with this, this notion of the art gallery becoming the work itself. These, there's no frame on these. On the wall, there are drawings of everyday objects. Now, you can look through these uh, drawings, you see, and uh, there's a whole 
host of them. Uh, you know, they became a sort of trademark, if you like, for Michael Craig Martin. And the objects are a sardine tin, a hammer, a sandal. You know, they're deliberately chosen to be neutral in that sense of he's trying to demystify the, if you like, the artwork, de depersonalize it. And, you know, so many of the objects you could just, there are things you wouldn't see. Because if you went into a room, you wouldn't see the fire extinguisher on the wall because it's just so normal for it to be there that you, you just don't notice it. So, you know, but this is a constant of finding with people, I guess, you know, that they, they simply miss the obvious. And what Craig Martin does, he focuses on the obvious. Now, I will say, though, that there is a pattern. So uh, I don't think he's managed perhaps to succeed exactly in stripping himself out of the equation because many of the objects that he draws they kind of represent I think uh, an experience of modern urban life there's containment there's tension or there's pressure implicit in, in, in these selected objects they're stripped of all context no, uh, you, you know, they're absolutely rendered in this totally kind of deadpan way. And his theory is when you come up to this artwork, you look at it and you bring to it your own narratives, you bring your own ideas. He, and they're very playful. Sometimes he's introducing materials like steel as well as, or neon as well as the, 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 the drawings. They begin to get more complex. Some of them become almost baroque and yet they're still stripped down, you just the, you know, the ice tray from the refrigerator, a light bulb, a chair, a step ladder, but that pattern of, of modern urban life, uh, it, it, it becomes a constant in them. As well as drawings on walls of gallery, he'll do drawings and prints ba based on those too. He does drawings with other everyday objects, Venetian blinds, <laughs> and he's creating minimalist sculptures from Venetian blinds just arranged, buy them from BHV and hang them, get them the right, get them made to order. And he creates monumental serial works of art, fully within that minimalist, you know, structuralist tradition and uh, out of just things that you'd buy in a hardware store. But he's, he, he, he becomes quite baroque as the years pass. And in 1996, you know, he's doing this sort of lurid colours. Magenta is a favourite colour of his. Richard Cork, the art critic, posits that it's his early exposure as a child to stained glass windows in the churches that he was in, that have kind of, you know, filtered through in his later years. And he's uh, now imagining himself to, to, to be in a sort of post-conceptual cathedral environment with, with stained glass. Vi the vivid colours of stained glass windows. I don't know how true that is. Th the, the fire extinguisher is one of the objects that comes up again and again. Some more everyday than not. We hope the handcuffs are not everyday. <laughs> and, uh, the, but the little um, cupboard, or the, you know, locker is, is very much an everyday. Mm -hmm. Very often references to the art world. We see the pipe, you know, we've mentioned it several times, Magritte. You see, you see the, 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 the little urinal there, which Duchamp famously exhibited in the Armory show in New York in 1913, signing it all mutt. You know, this was the idea that uh, Duchamp had that he was, um, uh, as one of the committee members of this exhibition, he was entitled to submit any work he wanted. So he just went to a hardware store and bought a urinal and put it in and signed it. I think the real story is a little more complicated. Some, there's a lot of mythologizing in the history of 20th century art, but essentially that work ha has entered the canon of, of uh, art and. Um, it's uh, Michael Craig Martin just, he just harvests it almost effortlessly, these, these, these signs, these meanings, the, the two cans, the Andy Warhol's uh, uh, things. And, and as I say, getting baroque in, in, in recent years, uh, extraordinary vivid colors and the images you know, abounding and proliferating. Very interesting work because it's attractive 
and live and sort of, but also very neutral and very dead at the same time. So it's very cool and yet very hot. And his puns are there, like these chair, you have to fill in the missing letter, you have to fill in the missing letter of the table and you know so he's still playing with these deconstructed words and letters and signs and symbols he, his work looks great in renaissance spaces and he's not slow to take advantage of them in valencia at ivan you know he creates his extraordinary interiors of, of vivid colors in in, in this uh, renaissance or gothic space and uh, it's uh, Yet you, you see this, this the uh, bucket there in the center. This mute rebuke to everyday expectation. In uh, Austria, in a chapel, he he uh, he might have come home in a way. His parents would be proud of him probably here, to have create. But look at the two daggers flying in towards the thing. So it's like he never misses a trick. Michael Craig Martin, he is very clever. If you happen to have the misfortune to go to London, um, <laughs> you might find yourself on the Docklands Light Railway. And if you do, get off at Woolwich Arsenal, because at least you'll be able to see uh, Craig Martin's uh, 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 wonderful murals in that station. Tokyo. That's, that's a, a screen he made for Tokyo. Floating World. Of course, a name referring to the images of uh, Ukiyo, Ukiyo-e. Images of the floating world from the 19th century. And a hospital for children in Oxford. Look at the scale of his work now. Th th absolutely monumental. And neon pieces, you know, the, in, in six-story buildings. This is in Kunsthall in 2006. The same images again and again. He, he has this visual language. He has a repertoire of, 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 of what you might call signs and signifiers, the angle poise light, the fire extinguisher. And uh, so whether it's Kunstverein in Hanover or uh, in, in, in uh, the, this insurance building. Look, oh, the five senses. Where did we see that? We remember the Brian O'Doherty piece from 1967, the five senses of the Bishop of Cloyne. And uh, so these two artists, I think, they kind of, you know, they're always looking a little and looking a little. And But he's really, Michael Craig Martin has done phenomenal uh, installations, per permanent installations. This is in, the, uh, in Luxembourg, in the European Investment Bank. And uh, it's part of a whole series of murals uh, on the walls of that building too. And in Chatsworth, he'll just poke the most delightful fun at, at uh, the, the whole enterprise of these formal gardens with, with the steel painted pink garden fork. It's, a, it's about four, you know, four meters high. These are big pieces and they sit in the landscape you know, in, in, with this like reference to the whole bucolic uh, nature of, of these uh, la uh, landscapes of the 19th century. So I'm, I'm, I must apologize. I think I've exceeded the hour yet again. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you'll forgive me. <laughs> but uh, it, it's been a pleasure uh, talking on these uh, uh, subjects and I hope that it has been uh, illuminating because uh, We've covered a lot of ground in the six lectures. Remember, all the way from the Battle of Kinsale right through to Michael Craig Martin. Uh, and uh, we've left out about three, four, five hundred wonderful artists who could have been included. And so this is simply, this is a small gas board of contemporary, of historic and contemporary art from Ireland or with this strong Irish connection and elements that, that, that we've talked about. So uh, 